Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is just to eat meat and that's what you should do. But if uh, you're hiking or road tripping or stuck at work and you want something nutritious that is just meat, fat, and possibly salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. I like this product not only because it is pure meat, but also because I really want the carnivore market to thrive as well. The more we support meat-only products, the more people will make meat-only products, and this will bring us into the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to check out, then take a look and use my discount code HTC to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys. We're back with another episode of the How To Carnivore podcast. We've got Dr. Anthony Chafee with us, and we've also got a special guest, Adam Kavanagh. Uh, and Adam described himself as a caveman. He's a, a normal guy who's gone bush. Uh, and definitely follow him on Instagram because he literally lives barefoot uh, in the bush up near uh, Cape York in northern Queensland, I believe, uh, and lives in like a teepee, uh, hunts for a lot of his own food, goes on adventures with the local Indigenous guys. Uh, and it's it's seriously fun to watch when you're trapped in the city and you're under fluorescent lights and you're looking at your phone too much, and then you watch Adam, it's it's real escapism. So, uh, Adam, welcome. Thank you, mate. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No, yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. And uh, so, so what are you up to uh, at the moment? Like, where, what's your, what, what's your day-to-day at the moment? Um, so, actually, I've had to do a lot of car repairs. So, I'm back in civilization at the moment. Mm-hmm getting a few repairs done uh getting prepared and ready to head back out into the bush for some uh more remote off-grid shenanigans basically nice and then what what made you decide to just head off into the into nature uh in the first place like what were you doing before and what 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 was the point they just said nope i'm done with this i'm out yeah um actually i should say first uh with your introduction and the tp Recently, the TP actually burned down, <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> and I and I made the TP out of um, out of paper bark and you know paper paper and paper bark and fire don't not a great combo, but that was a good learning lesson. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I, I've been traveling around Australia for a bit over six years now. Um, prior to that, I was a coal miner for. Uh, almost nine years and um yeah i I guess i I grew up in a coal mining town and and, you know you're a product of your environment so i naturally become a coal miner (laughs) it was like the done thing um and yeah like i think i got to about 23 and i started to notice some health issues popping their head up i was like at the time i wasn't very aware but I, i i thought it was like at the time, it was weird. I thought it was like sources or I knew it was like maybe preservatives or there was something happening that when I ate certain foods, I was like getting this urge to vomit and I'd just have the, like this really, yeah, it was just like these really weird feelings and then my eyes would get really swollen and just crazy stuff was happening. Um, at the time, I was in the man- mentality of she'll be right. So I didn't really look into it much further than that. I just kept going on with life and you know, going through those horrible feelings of like wanting to throw up and stuff and didn't really pay, pay it much more attention than that. Um, and then it was about when I was uh, 26, um, I got extremely sick. I got really bad anxiety and depression and um, went to the doctors. Thyroid conditions, uh, like they are, like I, they do run in my family, but what I had was different and it's usually like it seems to be in the females of the family have um graves disease but i went to the doctors and had blood tests it's not what i had and they don't exactly know they they thought maybe it was like some viral thing or they what they weren't they, they weren't too sure and they're like oh you know like this thyroid issue you're having you're probably not going to have it again it's probably a once-off um and even at that stage i did i do remember saying i was like oh it's kind of weird like i I know I'm eating certain things and like, you know, when I eat bread and stuff, I don't feel too great and um, not knocking health the system at all. But at the time he was, he was kind of like, you know, like, nah, that's probably not, 
that's probably not a cause of it. Like, don't worry about it. Just keep going on with life. And that's where I was at at the time. Like, okay, fine. Um, so I ended up, uh, I think I, it was like another, another two times I ended up going through thyroid issues and, and every time they triggered off, like it was just the most severe depression. And I'm sure everyone's symptoms are different. My, I had like an overactive thyroid. So I was having rapid weight loss. Jeez. And, um, I, I remember I had to take, uh, I forget what the medication is, but I had to take this one medication to basically stop myself having a heart attack. Um, cause my heart rate was just getting so rapid. It was like, I was not doing anything, just sitting still laying down and my heart rate was like higher than if I'd have gone for a run. And, um, I remember just like thinking stuff it because ultimately the doctors, um, and it was just like what I, what I had access to since then I've, I've got like, I've had access to doctors that are way better now, but at that time it was just, I guess, with what they knew they weren't really onto it and the link between different things that could be uh, making my thyroid play up. Anyway, basically it was at that stage where it's like, oh, you know, like maybe we can operate or there's some kind of procedure or something we can do. And I was, I was even at that stage where I was like, well, I don't know why I'm sick. So um, I wouldn't normally, but I was open. I'm like, uh, I wouldn't normally look into the things more than that. I'd just take someone's advice. But I, um, I remember getting on Google typed in thyroid and this book come up um why do i still have thyroid symptoms when my doctors say my lab results are normal it's got a really big really big title that book it's crazy how long the title is anyway <laughs> i read that book and one thing stood out to me it said a caveman diet has been shown to help heal a thyroid and i, and I was like all right i'm the kind of person maybe it's a bit of an addictive personality when i'm all in on something i'm all in so I went to the fridge, emptied it out, went completely paleo. Uh, the book said caveman, but I looked into it more and it was like at the time, uh, there was like Pete Evans had this paleo diet and I was like, all right, easy, done. And um, I had like instant results, like my health turned around. And um, yeah, here we are. It's been a bit of a journey uh, from there till now. Like I've experimented beyond paleo, obviously, like, uh, beyond paleo obviously but um yeah it's been a bit of a bit of a bit of a journey for sure nice and then and then so you're doing that made the dietary changes while still presumably working a normal job and yeah. then what what made you just say i i'm gonna go off grid now and just and just be a, a caveman <laughs> all right well actually it was um through the really severe anxiety and depression i I literally got to that stage where I worked shift work and it got to that stage where I'd worked out. I'm like, all right, like this paleo whole foods eating is really helping. But like in the book, it did say it was like shift work is really not ideal for someone in my condition, but I was on a high, like I was in a high paying job and I was like, not ready to give that up just yet. And um, what ended up happening was, uh, I think it was in the book. It was like, you know, maybe getting outside a bit more was could be helpful too. And actually that was one thing that the doctors did say at the time, if anything, he was like, mate, like maybe get outside a little bit more and just, you know, um, he suggested to go out into the garden more, but I was like, I went a bit further than that. I just started going out to the, into the bush a bit more. Um, I'd started noticing that when I was doing the night shifts, they were triggering off like panic attacks. So, I was in a fortunate position, like the whole time I've been working, I'd like never taken much time off work as far as like sick leave or anything. So I had a lot saved up. So I started like not going to night, uh, not going into work for night shift. I was just doing day shift. And then I'd have like seven days and I'd just go like fishing and hunting and camping and just basically be in the bush for that period of time. And I started to notice, I'm like, wow, I actually feel a lot better doing this. And then it went from that to like, oh, okay, like maybe I'll do this barefoot. And then it was like, I started hearing about sunscreens and stuff. Cause like, I'm the sort of person, I, I literally would go out to, into the sun at like sunrise and I'd be out for five minutes and I'd get completely sunburned, like third degree burns. I couldn't tolerate the sun at all. And uh, yeah, I started, I started, I was like, oh, like this is absolutely freaking crazy, but I'm going to go out and not put sunscreen on or swap it for like zinc. I think zinc was 
initially what I did, I started putting zinc on and I noticed, I was like, oh, this feels a lot better than the other sunscreens I was mm. using. And it was just like slowly spend more and more time in the bush, which is what I used to do as a kid anyway. So it was weird. I've done like this full circle back to who I used to be. And I just noticed I started to feel better and better. And then the ultimate uh, decider was I went to Africa for four months and I thought, all right, I, I've noticed that when I'm, when I'm not at work and I'm not doing night shift, I'm feeling better. So I thought, all right, I'll have four months off work completely and I'll just see how I feel. And if I feel like better, I'm probably going to quit my job. So I went to Africa and I came back absolutely jacked from like eating just all the, the whole foods over there, like all the um, off the side of the road, like the half raw chicken and the half raw goat and just all the bananas and stuff that were over there. And I absolutely come back so vibrant. And I was like, yeah, it's time to quit my job. I'd had yeah. some things. I'd had some family stuff happen that kind of made me realize how short life was so yeah i just went into work and i was like i have no idea what i'm doing but i'm going to quit my job and i'm going to go live in the bush yeah <laughs> that's awesome though and, and, and it's cool that you just actually went out and did it and um you know, how, how did you pick did you do you know people that were living out in the bush or do you just like just just throw a dart on a map and be like i'm just gonna i'm just gonna rock out there and set up yeah camp. I, I honestly had no idea I'd remember it, it, when I was 19, I'd actually written down like one of my goals in life was to travel Australia. Cause that, that like right up until I was 23, I hadn't left Queensland. I, I hadn't even been like within a couple of hours of where I lived. And it was just this goal I'd written down. I thought, you know what, stuff it. I've got nothing to lose. I'm just going to go travel Australia. No idea what I'm doing. Um, even at that stage, I guess really, I didn't realize I was going to end up spending so much time in the bush. It was more just, that seeking of adventure, that call to adventure. And um, it's been an evolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So did it start off with uh, kind of like traditional camping style adventures, Adam? And then you... Yeah. Yeah. Like just your, from there. Your, your typical like, uh, you know, going camping, going fishing, sightseeing, that's for the camping. And then it was actually uh, over time, my adventures were getting a little bit more extreme. Mm -hmm. and um i'd realized i was like all right i probably should you know get a bit more bush knowledge seems i'm spending more time in the bush and my adventures are getting a little bit more crazy it's like you know there's a potential for something to go wrong so yeah i started to you know learn about bush skills a little bit more and then also being lucky enough to spend time with the indigenous people and then like seeing a whole another way of hunting and fishing and you know, a way of being in the bush. And then that was one of the biggest pieces of the puzzle too. And then grew from, and it was just, yeah, it's just like every, uh, over the last couple of years, I've just eventually started to um, camp less comfortably, like take it to the, the extreme a little bit more and a little bit more. And then, yeah, it's uh, evolved into doing a TV show for uh, on that, uh, one of the t uh, Discovery Channel's TV shows, and it's just been crazy where it's where it's led. That's awesome. And how, how did you meet uh, the local indigenous uh, people? Is it just through out being out in the bush, or did or how did you make that connection and let you do that? Because that, that was that's been a dream of mine since I was a kid to just like go out in the bush and just like, and like live with the the native Australians and like just learn all the different things that uh, just the way they live, you know, historically. Yeah, I guess it's not. It's not as like, there's a, there's this romanticized idea of like the real living in the bush and to a degree, like with all our modern stuff, you know I mean? Like they're not doing it as traditionally as they used to be like, but why, why would they, if you've got all this new technology, but it was actually, um, it was right before I'd completely stopped drinking. So this was one of my first trips around Australia where I'd actually met one of the indigenous guys and I, I randomly went to the pub and it was, I was even at that stage actually where I knew I was like, I don't feel really good when I drink, but I'd, anyway, I'd wound up at this, at this pub in the middle of nowhere and I'd met this guy and he, he had invited me out fishing, one of the indigenous guys. And it was like, yeah, he's like, yep, we'll go fishing. Anyway, it was two years later. He randomly called me and he said he ready to go fishing. And I was like, what? I was like, who is this? <laughs> what a legend. But, but he called me. It was like, he called me as if it was yesterday. And like, I'm best mates with him now. He's an absolute lovely gentleman. Every two years. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he just randomly called me up. And at that stage, I had quit my job. So it was like, 
that trip I'd done there, I was still working. It was just, I just started to branch out a little bit more. Um, and this is before I went paleo. This was like the first time I got sick. Mm. I just needed a bit of time off work. Um, yeah, I was still living a normal life when I first met him. And then when I met him the second time, I was like, oh, well, actually, I'll just quit my job. I said, I'll see you soon. Like, I just yeah. quit my job. I'm like, I got nothing on. So I went up there yeah. and yeah, it, it just went from there. Like, we just got along so well because we, like our passion for hunting and fishing and stuff. And then, yeah, he's like really invited me into the community and made me feel welcome. Um, but it is it is rare to have that to have that. I'm very privileged and lucky to be allowed to spend time up there the way that I do. So I was just grateful that I met him. And um, yeah. yeah, nice. And so, are you mostly just just living off the land, just hunting, fishing, and uh, and that's it? Or do you bring stuff with you as well? Mm. Yeah, uh, I do a combination of things when I'm out. Like here now, while I'm back in town. I'm just going to the butchers and, and doing the everyday stuff just because I've been pretty busy setting some stuff up. But once I'm out in the bush, I only hunt and gather from the bush. Hell yeah. So, awesome. Yeah. If, if I have to go to the butchers at all, it's pretty rare. If, yeah. if at all, that I've got to go get food. Like when I'm in the bush, yeah, I spend a lot of time hunting with the Indigenous crew too. That's, that's definitely one of the biggest ways I get food. But yeah, when I'm up there, it's mostly just fishing and hunting to, to get food or foraging. Nice. And then do you, um, do you bow hunt, uh, gun hunt? Like what do you, boomerangs? Like what are you guys, what are you guys doing? Yeah. Um, mostly like, so when I was young, I grew up on a farm and we used, used to use guns a fair bit out there. And um, I guess it was when I was, was about 19, my brothers started to get into archery and bow hunting. And that really, that sort of caught my interest. And then it was once I started to spend more time in the bush, I was like, oh, like this, this bow hunting is like a very feasible way of getting food. And then I really got passionate about it. So I mostly bow hunt. Um, I love to fish. One of my uh, main hunting forms that I use that's probably not so well known is I do a lot of persistence hunting where I'll run an animal down and catch it by hand with, with nothing else. That's like, wow. that's my, that's how yeah, I love it. Yeah. 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 What, yeah. what sort of animal are we talking? Uh, I've, I've caught goats, pigs, uh, scrub cattle, like wild cattle. Sick. Yeah. yeah wow. You're wrestling down a cow and just like taking it down. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I don't recommend it. I don't recommend <laughs> it. But, uh, um, yeah. I, I have done it. That's so. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's badass. Like how long does it take to, to run one of these things down? I mean, it's hours and hours. I mean, those things can just go forever really. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I recently read a book called born to run mm. and it, it goes right into like, um, you know, that, that real long distance form of like ultra, ultra, you know, running. And um, I've personally found it was actually in that book. I, I noticed why some of the, the ways that I hunt, why I don't end up, doing really big long persistence hunts is because like the weather up where i hunt you know typically it can be up in the high 30 usually 40 degrees if not more um so the animals don't can't cool their bodies as efficiently as we can but we can also like carry water and stuff as well so not to say that they don't cool down as efficiently as we do but like you know we have some some advantages in the ability to carry water but i've also found if I do a sprint, I can outrun an animal in the first initial part of the chase. So like within at least 100 metres or 200 metres, I can catch most animals without it having to go to like a long distance run. Right. But like the, the Hudson and stuff in Africa, they're doing like, you know, I've seen a documentary where they like ran up, like it was like a couple of days they were chasing an animal before the animal expired. But it was like, I personally... None of my hunts have ever gone like that. It's just generally I do a really big sprint and I can I can outrun my if it gets to a stage where the animals we get into somewhat of a long distance run. Um, I've generally found animals maybe will only go like a kilometer or two and then I've generally caught them anyway. And then oh, wow. that, like I haven't I haven't caught them at all. I've <laughs> I've got yeah, out. Gone. Yeah. 
Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's really cool. Mm. And, and, and that's uh, that's probably one of the more badass ways of hunting I think is imaginable. <laughs> it's just actually just running it down and wrestling yeah. it down. What and then uh, and what happens when you catch it? Are you, are you like lassoing it, or you're are we stabbing it? How, how does this work? Uh, uh, yeah, generally, um, I let a lot of the animals go when I catch them that way. It's more of just like that. Scaring the hell out of them. That's <laughs> of like you, you versus the animal, but like no weapons or anything. It's like just you versus the animal. Like there's no barrier yeah. between you and the animal. You know what I mean? But uh, that's also why I like bow hunting because you have to get so close to the animal. Like you know, it's it it's there's like an advantage for the animal as well. You know what I mean? Like it's fair. It's like an even playing field to a degree. You've got to get close. There's a there's a lot of chances like it's going to smell you or see you and run off. So I, it just feels more fair to me. There's just something about that primal aspect of it. So that's generally why I'm yeah sticking to the bow hunting or the persistence hunting. But um. Yeah, I'll generally with the persistence hunting. If I am going to eat an animal, yeah, it's it's like um, stabbing the animal, yeah, with a knife, like a quick. Um, oh, it's like pretty graphic. I don't know if, it, it, <laughs> if you want to explain it, but there's like an artery artery ball above the heart, which can be reached either through the top of the ridge the rib rib cage or through the side of the back of the leg. So depending on the animal would depend on which way you would, you know, you would, you would process the animal, but um, it is surprised. Like it, it's surprising how quick it actually is, but uh, generally, generally I'm pretty, yeah. If I, if I'm catching an animal by hand, I don't usually tend to eat them that way because I've, you know, run them down and it's like stressed out a little bit. So yeah, I pick and choose my battles there. With that one. Yeah. No, that's cool. And then, um, I mean, would I mean some of, some of these animals are going to be you know big, probably you know as big or maybe even bigger than you. And how does that work? Do you, do you do you go for those those kinds of animals? Or you go for the smaller smaller ones. I guess I am going for the smaller ones, mm -hmm. but um, after spending time with the indigenous people, so the indigenous stuff aside, like they're great with cattle, like in horsemanship, like they're. They, they like it is impressive to watch them work with animals like work with horses work with cattle their ability to catch and wrestle a full-grown bull to the ground like a like you know like a 50 kilo guy can pull a full like you know nearly ton animal to the ground by by themselves so watching that watching that and doing that with the guys because when they hunt you know obviously they have access to guns so they're like chasing an animal on a motorbike or in a in like a four-wheel drive and then jumping off the back and catching it and then having to wrestle it like they don't have any other way wow. wow so it's it's been through that like it's not like i just woke up one day and knew how to do it it's like i've been hanging out with the guys who are like pros at this stuff and watching and learning from them yeah, interesting and um what about kangaroos those things fight back generally so uh, as far as hunting goes like native animals, I can only hunt and process when I'm with the indigenous people mm. on oh, okay. indigenous land. But um, kangaroos, generally, you need a permit. But also with bow hunting, you're only allowed to harvest invasive species. So I'm only allowed to, to hunt like pigs and um, goats, deer, wild cattle, stuff like that. Okay. But yeah, when I'm hanging out with the indigenous people, I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to hunt kangaroos and stuff like that. But there's seasons that certain animals are better to eat. So I just, whenever I'm hunting something like that, it's with the indigenous people because they are so better at picking the seasons. So like there'll, there'll be a huge period of time where they won't touch a kangaroo or a wallaby right. because they just know it's just like, it's not going to be in good condition. It's going to be low body fat percentage. It's not going to be like the most tasty. They'll wait until they're really well conditioned and they're super fatty and then we'll eat them in that period of time and the animals taste amazing mm. so in in general are you going for fattier animals yeah always the indigenous people are always always going for the fatty the fatty cuts of meat for sure like um there's a bird up there uh the the local name or like the the nickname of the animals the plain turkey or the bush turkey or just the turkey oh yeah um, but it's actually like a, a buzzard or a busted, it's called. And um, 
they're the same. Like there's a season when the grasshoppers get really thick and when they're eating all the grasshoppers, they get super, super fatty. And mm. that's the same. Like if they hunted one and it wasn't very fatty, like they're not as inclined to eat it just because they know it's not going to taste very good. But when an animal's fatty, it's going to taste good. And I've been lucky enough to, to try both. Like, you know, I've tested an animal out that wasn't fatty and then I had one that was fatty and I can see why you would not even waste your time hunting something that's not fatty, like purely just for the taste as well as like, you know, the calorie input of eating an animal is like getting the most out of it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was, uh, I was speaking to um, Aboriginal guy just at the hospital and we were just talking about uh, your nutrition and things like that. And, uh, and he had, he was obviously living in, in Perth and in the city. And so he was eating just normal Western stuff and he was, and he was having a lot of health issues, which is why he was in the hospital. And we just sort of got to talking about, you know, traditional ways of eating. And I was telling him about sort of the research I was doing and Is the fat and i was like couldn't agree with you more you know and that's um that's something that, that people understand you know when you're when they're living out in in the wild like that fat is very important fat i mean fat makes makes a play like, yeah like i've seen like when when i'm with indigenous, <laughs> indigenous guys and you know like say we get one of the wild cattle and we're processing it like it's just the how truly excited they are like they are so pumped when the animals like they'll generally only go for the fatty ones, but when you get an animal that's like really, really fatty, like it's in very, very good condition, mm -hmm. like that's when everyone gets super excited. Yeah, <clears throat> nice. And Is I've even noticed it actually, I'll, when I'm out in the bush doing my little stints where, I, where I'll go up there and just live out there for a couple of months, when I eat the, when I eat the, wild, the wild meats and stuff, I, I notice that I can eat less so I'm eating less food, but I'll tend to like be more muscular and more defined and jacked than when I'm in town and I have access to all this food, even though I'm still eating like, you know, beef and chicken and whatever. There's just, there's just something about that pure wild animal where like, like, you know, obviously I'm not a nutritionist or anything where I'm getting with where I'm going. This is just from my own personal experience. Yeah. I've noticed that like when I eat the wild animals, like my body represents that but like when i when i'm in town even though i'm still like you know trying to mostly eat like grass-fed and organic and all that it's just like you can't compare the two like eating a wild animal and the way my physique looks if like that's just we want to just go off that one thing alone like just my physique it's just generally like so much more robust when i'm eating wild animals and eating less food than when mm -hmm. i'm in town with access to heaps of food it's just like crazy yeah, uh, I've, I've noticed that as well. Um, and I've noticed also that older animals seem to satisfy me more and they just, and they just taste better as well. They have a more, more rich flavor, I guess you could say. I, I got a, a source, like a 10 year old cow and just, you know, grass fed its whole life, just lived out in a pasture and that was it and never had any grains or anything. And, um, and that, first of all, it smelled a lot different. Like the smell of the meat, there's just something fresh and, and just wholesome to it. And when I ate it, I just, it, it just like supercharged me. I need, I needed way less. It was much more lean as well. So I was actually getting a lot less fat, but I was much more satisfied. I was, I was much more satiated and I felt a lot better as well. And, and like I say, I ate, I ate much less of that and I felt better too. So I think there is something to that. And I think, um, obviously the, the animal being healthy and eating its natural diet, it plays a big role, but also I think that just being an older animal as well, I think it just becomes more nutritious as, as more years to just deposit, uh, nutrients. And that, and that's where that flavor comes from, you know, like, like veal or even like a, you know, young steer year, or two year old, uh, you know, steer that we buy at the market. <clears throat> I mean, it tastes fine to us because we, 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 uh, are used to it. But in comparison to like a, uh, like an older animal, like a 10 year old cat, like it, it almost has no flavor in comparison. I've noticed that. And I think that that's just the deposition of, of nutrients. I think. Yeah. I've, I've noticed, um, like eating the wild animals, especially with like the cattle, like the, the stuff I get from town here now, it, um, has a more mild, gentle flavor. 
um, as well as like the meat's a lot softer from the stuff in town, but like the wild stuff is way harder. Like right, I okay. always get really good jaw muscles, but also like the, the flavor is so much more strong. Like you can taste the cow. Like it's just like, wow, that's really strong, which is surprising for most people that maybe have it for the first time. Like it can probably be a little bit much because you're like, whoa, that's like a really strong flavor. But on the opposite side of that, Organ meats, I find when I buy them from, from like uh, from town, I guess I, it might have something to do with the the storage time that they've been stored. They tend to get like this a lot stronger, more um, maybe not so great smell and taste. But when I when I eat the wild organ meats out of the animals, they mm. they nearly have like very a very mild soft smell like it's not like a very strong smell at all but the flavor is also way better like after eating the wild animal organ meats i do struggle to eat the stuff from town because it's just like the, the, the taste so different mm -hmm. it, yeah it's just it's so you can't compare the two it's just like one is so damn good mm. compared to the other one and it's oh, like i'm not exactly sure why that is like maybe it's time that it's stored versus eating something that's fresh yeah, no, that that might be it. I reckon. I mean, yeah. and, uh, Adam, I heard you talking on another podcast about eating wild boar testicles, and you said it's you said they're delicious, which is hard to believe. And I yeah. know that most people don't eat them. It's a, it's hard to accept. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, a couple of yeah, meaty balls. <laughs> um, in my time hunting, it was like definitely in the hunting community eating eating that kind of stuff it is probably a bit of a bit of a mind mind blower for most of the most of my mates that do hunt but it's definitely been from hanging out with the indigenous people and you know like seeing them eat all these like basically every organ in the animal and i was like wow okay like there's basically nothing that's off limits as far as eating and then like it's actually surprising how good different things taste and um there's also this idea it's just like generally like a big old boar you wouldn't eat it just because they are such a strong animal, like the, the gamey meat flavor, just like, and sometimes boars do get very smelly. Like I, that's, that's understandable. Like why that, why you probably wouldn't want to eat one. They get extremely horrible. Like the smell is so bad. Especially their balls um, are bad. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's just like, weirdly, that was the best part of the pig, like the testicles, and the guy that was with me on the tour, like he even said, he's like, wow, man, like, I think I can, he's like, he, he said, he was like, I'm be, I've been buzzing for three days. He's like, I think I've like absorbed that energy, that like testicle energy. And it was just like, yeah, he was like, oh man, I wish, I wish my partner was here, but he was just like, <laughs> I, need, um, I need to eat these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm solved. Like, yeah. I was like, no more. Don't, don't eat any more. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but yeah like i'll have to agree like even myself like i feel so much more like robust and vibrant mm -hmm. eating that stuff and it's like it maybe it is a bit of a mind blower for people to eat like the testicles but if there's that like that ancient culture idea of like you you when you eat that part of the animal it's like what you need but like so we ate those testicles and it was like we just got like a testosterone shot like we felt bloody good yeah that's funny and do you, you cook it or you eat that stuff raw um you know like obviously you when you watch like instagram you see someone like liver king eating raw testicles with the wild pork in australia like a, a lot of the animals i am eating like well not all of the animals but they definitely had worms and stuff like that but especially with the pork i like i'll eat raw raw beef i've, I've eaten a lot of the like raw liver a lot of the uh, beef animal i've eaten a lot of that raw I guess there's that's that's still that old part of me that's like oh you know you should be careful with pork so i haven't eaten uh raw pork testicles yet but yet we'll, yet. we'll yeah. we'll leave that we'll leave that open-ended for now but i haven't had them raw yet so how that's are you um how are you cooking most of the food so if you <clears throat> let's, let's use a scrub uh, scrub cow as an example or scrub ball um are you like I suppose you don't really have time to like age it at all or dry it out? And are you cooking it in a pan or are you kind of putting it, chucking it straight on the fire? What's what, what do you go to? Because of the temperature um, up where I am in the north, 
you basically like say you are to harvest an animal late afternoon is the best time so you can leave it out overnight wow okay and um because of like my restrictions i've got like a 60 liter fridge in my car that's solar powered so i can only store so much meat but also you in the cooler cooler months i've left meat out for a lot longer like i've left it out for like a day and a half or something like that and that feels okay but when it's really hot you do have to you do have to be careful like i've had meat go off relatively quickly even overnight meat's gone off because it's like stays hot doesn't cool down so generally yeah you want to get it in the afternoon let it cool overnight but like we'll put it on gum leaves so like it gets airflow all the way through because what happens is like say you put it down on a flat surface that underside is not going to be so good it'll stay wet like meat when the air touches it will get like this really tacky film and it's like that's the meat setting and that's generally what you want um my indigenous mates will will take the meat home and put it put it on their table in their house and put the air con on so like they'll leave it for a few days but like because i don't have access to that stuff i just have to like give it you know give it uh, give it a day half a day that's the max i can let it air out unless it's cold temp like a cold cold weather and then i have let meat stay out for a lot longer even pork like i've, I've nearly left pork out for two days before i put it in the fridge yes. so um, I'm, pr I'm pretty limited there as far as cooking goes the ritual after we get wild beef is the indigenous crew will take the rib bones and chuck them straight into hot coals and we'll just eat them straight out of the fire um i have cooked a lot of meat that way as well like i do get a bit a bit um uh, prissy every now and again and i'll i generally cook most of my meat in a cast iron pan so pretty much it's either yeah it's either in the fire uh, straight in the hot coals or it's in the cast iron pan or sometimes if we if like say we get a decent sized animal and we're going to feed a lot of the community with it we'll uh there's a big ground oven and we'll put it in the in the ground oven or the dundee oven they call it up there and we'll um yeah, we'll, we'll cook a lot of meat in there. That's that's one of the best ways to cook meat, but it just takes like a full day to cook it. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that would be good. I mean, you get slow cook because <clears throat> a lot of the stuff is going to be very tough, especially the the wild older animals as well. And so like doing that slow cook would be would be really good. Um, <clears throat> what about like preserving meat? I mean, because obviously you get you get like a big animal. I guess if you're if you're hunting in a group and you have a lot of people, then everyone just takes their portions out and they have enough in you know, fridge space and things like that. But <clears throat> do you know what the, the, or was there that, you know, of a <clears throat> traditional way of, of preserving meat, uh, the, you know, like, like, you know, native Americans had pemmican, you know, where they dry up the meat, crush it up and mix it with fat. Did, did the, the aboriginals have something similar? And do you, do you do something like that as well? Um, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned pemmican. That's actually one of my favorite ways to, uh, to make, like I'll make, make these little pemmican bars, and i'll mm. like travel around with them they're like that's like my travel food as i'll make nice. pemmican. absolutely love pemmican um for myself personally i'd say yeah either smoking meat or mm -hmm. air drying it would be the form of preserving it but generally just with the temperature up there and with how much i eat mm -hmm. I, I don't usually worry about preserving it that way it's just like that's a last resort if i was in a survival situation that i'd do it that way from my experience with the indigenous people, um, I, I haven't, like I'm sure there probably is, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any food preservation. Just whenever food is wanted, it's got fresh. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. that's what I've seen, yeah. Makes sense. And I guess if you're, if you're working with sort of smaller animals, like, like a bunch of kangaroo or something like that, or you, like a, a crocodile, I mean, that, that'll feed a you know, whole, whole uh, group of people you know, for a few days or something like that. Uh, you get a few of these things, but I guess like, you know, if you're taking down a mammoth, like you just, you have to figure out how to, how to make that thing sort of last. But I guess if the, you know, there's smaller fauna here, maybe they didn't have to do that, but I guess if they got like a whole, you know, herd of kangaroo and things like that, they might, that might run into that, but yeah. Huh, interesting. Well, that's cool that you make, you make the pemmican as well. Yeah. 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 Like I could be, I could be wrong with the food preservation. Like they're like still every time I'm hanging out with the indigenous people or, you know, going to museums or, or hearing things or reading books. Like I'm always finding out new stuff that I didn't know before. Like there's so much knowledge to know. It's like, I'm not going to admit that I, I know everything. Like there's yeah. no way. So I'm sure there is like, even 
it was recently there's all these like really complicated fish traps that the indigenous people use, which I didn't know they used that. But mm. just from from my time with them, yeah, like I, I I haven't seen any food preservation, so to speak. Like I'm sure there is in some forms, but not not exactly. Um, but yeah, it was it was a couple of years ago I heard about the pemmican, and then I'll I'll like dry the mince out and then add uh, dripping to it, and it just absolutely like yeah. Uh, actually, I should go make some now. Actually, that you're talking about <laughs> yeah. And so, so do you, is that how you, you, you grind up, do you, do you guys have a grinder? So if you have like the tougher parts of the animal that you hunt, would you like just grind that down and then have that as, as mince and then make pemmican out of that? Or, or what do you do with that? Um, the pemmican is generally just something I'd personally do. The indigenous guys basically slow cook everything. That's really tough. Like what we're saying, if there's something that's super tough, it's slow cooked or, um, we'll mince it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To, to bypass it, so like nothing gets wasted. <clears throat> okay, but yeah. And so, and so you make pe- pemmican out of mints and then drying out the mints and then add add uh, you know render that them. to that. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So and, do you, and, do you have like a, like a hand grinder or what do you guys have? Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I I think that's probably also why I get fairly fit out in the bush. I I got like uh, basically I I got a scrub ball and I had this this really small hand mincer. And I had to mince, I had to mince the whole thing. And I can tell you, <laughs> it took me a long time with a hand mincer to mince a whole ball. I've, I've since went and bought an industrial mincer just because I, oh, um, yeah. when I'm with the indigenous guys, you know, just to make it more, more usable. But yeah. um, personally, before I, I got to that stage, I was just hand mincing <clears throat> everything. I mean, yeah. like, not, if it was tough, if it was, if it was yeah. like at that stage where I was like, oh, okay, like I'm working out my jaws too much. Yeah. then I'd, I'd mince it because yeah. it's not like the meat doesn't doesn't taste bad just because it's tough it's just it's like all the meat it. to taste great it's just tough but yeah like to be honest um if i was in this situation like say I, I was out on one of those like tv shows or something like that where where i'm in a position where like something like that had to happen or if i'm out on one of my crazy adventures really tough meat like that cut dried in the air then ground up that would be one way to make it. Like if I turned it into panic and that would be one way around, around that for sure. That is, that would work pretty good. Yeah. Mm. And, the, and you said you were on a, on a discovery TV show too, which, which one was that? Was that discovery uh, or did I miss or you? Yeah. Uh, Naked and afraid. I was, I was wondering that I was just like, this guy would kill it on that. <laughs> yeah. Show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely loved it. It's like one of the, it, it is, I'd have to say it's like one of the most, uh, transformational experiences i've ever been through to go through something that tough yeah it was definitely a level up yeah so there wasn't much food out there hey adam no no because it was in a desert it was in a desert setting so yeah there was basically nothing <laughs> yeah yeah and then uh so how, <clears throat> how did you I, I imagine that you would you'd have done a lot better than most people who go on that show like what was it like like walk us through it well, I guess it's hard to say, but it was, um, <clears throat> I, I guess it come down to like, not so much of my hunting skills. Uh, it was more of like my foraging ability and like a lot of stuff <laughs> I used to do as a kid with my dad out fishing, you know, like collecting, um, catching small fish or catching yabbies or um, crabs, like a by hand or making, uh, or what we'd do, we'd actually, when I was a kid, we'd tie meat to a piece of string <laughs> and we'd throw it out in the water and then you'd wait and you'd see this, like you'd, you'd see something tugging at the string and then you'd slowly pull the string in and you'd have a little net or a little net or a scoop waiting. And then you'd pull the yabbies or fish or crabs into the net and then you'd scoop them out of the water. Hmm. And it was funny when I was out there, you got a lot of time and I just, I'd have a lot of time to really sit there and really think about how to extract food from the location you're in. And I was sitting there really thinking about it. And then the, the lady I was with, my partner, she made a fish trap and I thought, that's it. I've got to make a little a little scoop. So I weaved up this scoop and I got to use it a few different ways. I'd either, I'd, I'd, bait, I'd bait the water up and I'd wait for the fish to, to come into the scoop and then I'd scoop them up or I was just actively just scooping fish out of the water or I'd, yeah, I had a few different ways that I would use that, but it worked. And I was like, wow, like how crazy that something so simple yeah. could work like that. But then the, the, uh, like when I was a kid, I'd just grab stuff out of the water. And in the end, that was like one of the most, that was like the biggest food reward 
um, that I had was like there was these freshwater crabs walking around. I was just grabbing them by hand. So yeah, it's just crazy that like it it's not as extreme or as like fancy as you think it would be. It's just really simple, low energy, but it, like it was very efficient. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, how how long were you out there for? It was it was twenty one days. Yeah, it's a long wow. time. So the actually the probably the biggest food reward I got was I I'd, I'd walk pretty far and I walked up there's like this real rocky mountain and I was up there and I was actually trying to find some snakes or scorpions I was like because I was just that hungry I'm like right I'm gonna try to I'm gonna eat anything and you know I had heard there was like snakes or scorpions in the area and I thought oh that'd be great like that'd be that'd be a pretty good feed and when I was up there I could like hear these bees and I thought. I was like, that sounds like bloody bees. And then I found this big cave and it was full of bees. I looked in there and it was just full of honey and, and comb. And I thought, all right, I've never done this before, but I think I'm going to have a crack at smoking these guys out because there was so much honey in there. Yeah. I'd never done it before. And like, obviously the show, like the premise of the show is that you're fully naked. So <laughs> oh, I'd, no. I'd walk back down. I'd carried some hot coals back up to this cave Um it, it didn't really get shown in the TV show, but the lady I was with, she had to make, she had to make these shoes because um in Australia we call them like goat head thorns, but there was these thorns in the sand and you literally could not walk on them. They were that bad, so she made these shoes so we could get back up there. I kind of just walked through the thorns trying to muscle my way through it. But it was, yeah. mm. We got back up to the cave, never done it before. Smoked the bees out and it bloody worked. And then I got all this honey. And I literally come out of the, the cave and I was just like from head to toe, just gr- it's it's listening like, and dripping with honey. Like Winnie the Pooh it. coming out of there. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, was a, it was bloody the greatest feeling. You could see like from not having any food to having all that, that yeah. um, those carbohydrates, my body just got like so swollen. I like could have yeah. been on a bodybuilder stage. I was just like, wow. <laughs> but um, it didn't last long. I ate it pretty quick. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. That's awesome though. Like, so at, at the end of that, is it just, um, you survive, you make it out of there. Is there like a, a reward at the end? You, did you, is there, is it a competition or is it just see if you can do it? it? It's more just like to see if you can do it. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, that's the added challenge is like seeing if you can make it all the way to the 21 days. Like they do have extended versions of the show, like 40 days, 60 days, which I'd love to do one day. But okay. at this day, I've only done the 21. So I made it all the way to the end and my partner did it as well. So yeah, it's like you can be proud of that for now and then hopefully one yeah. day you get to try something a bit more extreme. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd love to see you on a loan. Yeah, yeah I'd, oh, mate, I would love to get on there myself. Like <laughs> it's so crazy because like in, in Naked and Afraid, you basically only have like one item or two items that you can use, but on a loan, you get 10. Um, yeah, you get 10 items. And I'm just like, I'd probably, be, I'd be like, oh, what, 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 what I don't even know if I could think of 10 yeah. things need to take so it's just like i've taken some yeah i don't know it, it's you know, a much cold it's a much colder environment that's one thing that as well so yeah, that, that's where that low body fat percentage and the cold is yeah. brutal like yeah, you really feel the temperature when you get low body fat yeah but i guess you have clothes too so that that's one thing you're not you're not yeah. naked up in alaska or something like that yeah. you know? i'd probably still do it naked yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and they like and, make your own clothes like when you take yeah. down like a moose or something like that and you like you know make some, where it's head make, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see if i ever get on there we'll see uh and um and your nutrition now adam are you uh are you primarily carnivore or you know what what works for you um i guess i've recently got into uh, a lot of paul paul check stuff and i guess he's got like three types of of eating so to speak there's like polar equatorial and um i forget what it is but it's like more flexible but basically i guess if you split the plate for each of the individual diets like one diet's like half and half like half your plate would be meat half or like meat or protein half your plate would be vegetables or you know some kind of plant and then uh, for the polar type which i he's got like a food test i did the test and basically most of my plate should be meat and only a very small portion or a garnish of my plate should be plants. And then there's like obviously the other diet, which is like mostly plants, a little bit of meat, but through the testing, I, I could even tell you, like I, I, I knew that wasn't going to be me. Yeah. Um, just through my own experience, like I, 
I initially went paleo and it worked great for a couple of years. And then it was like, it got to that stage where I was like getting super bloated. Hmm. And at the time, um, I remember going to this health food shop and the lady said to me, she's like, oh, it's because I'm eating too much meat. I'm getting bloated from all the meat that I'm eating. And, I'm, and even at the time I was like, oh, like I don't even really feel like I'm, like I'm eating that much meat. But yeah. I was like, okay. So I, I started to um, back my meat off more and more. Cause like, I, I guess I know what she was trying to tell me. She was like, oh, I need to go plant-based. And I was like, all right, like I'm open to anything. Like, that's cool. I started to go more plant-based, completely open-minded. Like I hadn't had no judgment like carnival wasn't as prominent as it is now. Um, plant-based was obviously pretty popular at that stage. So I was like, okay, yep. I'm open to anything. If it works, it works. I'm like, I'll, I'll do anything if it works. I started to go more plant-based and my symptoms got worse and worse of bloating, diarrhea, everything just got like really bad. And I thought, all right. And I think at that time, uh, I'm pretty sure I, it was around the time I listened to a Joe Rogan podcast and it might've been Sean Baker that, that mentioned carnival. Anyway, it wasn't, it wasn't well known at that stage. And even at that time I was like absolutely shitting myself, but I was like, the reason I went, I, I had a crack at carnival was I actually started to back the plants off and I noticed I was feeling better and I wasn't having like so much stomach upset. I wasn't getting bloated. A lot of my issues went away and I was like, all right, there might actually be something here. And it was at the same time I'd heard about carnivore. So I was like, all right, what happens if I just remove all plants? I was like so scared. I'm like, I'm probably going to die if I don't eat plants. Oh, that's like, that's where I was at. I just had no, I had no idea what I was in for. It literally was, is probably the best I've felt to date because I like, I removed everything. But then I guess I'm always never one to to want to get stuck in one place like i'm i'm always the goal for me is like all right in a survival situation i should have the ability to be able to eat plants if i have to and meat if i have to depending on what i have available to me so that's that's more why like i'm still trying to add plants in and and work it out and it was so weird to to say this but it was actually by going carnivore was what healed my guts enough to be able to eat plants again which blows yeah. up it's like, that's you know, how it works it's, it's yeah. counterintuitive yeah. yeah yeah so it was like and it was weird I, i'd become intolerant to like eggs and um it was just these weird foods that i was having super bad reactions to and then after carnivore it was like i could eat eggs again it was just like these foods that i was super sensitive to i could add them back in and even now where i'm at like i'm definitely uh still having some reactions to some plants, but nothing like before. Like what I can eat now is a hundred times better than what it was before. But I do still find um, like that polar diet in the pool check system seems to be that if I am going to eat plants at all, it just has to be small amounts. Like I can't just something to do with my makeup, which is way more complicated than I want to get into because I don't really know what I'm talking about. Mm. But I definitely seem to do better if I have less plants. And then the the more recent thing that I've I've sort of worked out is I definitely <clears throat> I've noticed that I do have a parasite and fungal issue. So I think that's potentially why carnival was working so good for me is that like I was starving a lot of the fungal stuff and the parasite stuff, like really starving them of the food. So that's why when I was not eating like when I do eat plants and stuff, like potentially a lot of the starchy stuff is why I'm getting so bloated. And um, I'm still dabbling in that at the moment, but I, I definitely have found, and if I have, yeah, depending on the food I eat, it definitely seems to be a thing that like, I guess, because my gut bacteria is out of whack, which is one thing that carnival really helps. Because like if I go carnivore and then add plants back in, I'm fine. But if I start having too many plants and starchy things, then I'll start to flare up my gut symptoms. So like carnivore is always the safe place I can go back to. It's always the reset. It's my safe zone. It's more like, yeah, I'm going to these extremes to work out how to add plants back in, which is like the craziest thing I'd, I'd ever thought I'd be doing. So, Yeah, well, I mean, but it makes sense to you because you, you do get, there's so many things in plants. I mean, the way, the way I came to this, um, 
from, from eating carnivore was like, was like 22 years ago when I was taking cancer biology and we just learned how toxic plants were. And this is how they naturally defend themselves, you know, studying botany and biology. And this is just how plants defend themselves. They use toxins and, and, you know, we don't have all the, the buildup of, uh, of herbivores for, you know, to, to eat plants as readily as they do, but even, even herbivores, they eat very specific plants because they have the defenses to the poisons in those plants, but they don't have the defenses in other plants and they'll get very sick if they eat other plants. And so there are a lot of things like, you know, different lectins and other things, you know, like, um, wheat germ gluten is a classic example of causing leaky gut and actually damaging the connection and binds between the enterocytes in your, in your intestine. And then all these different plant toxins get into your body, get into your system, bacteria gets in your system and, and it just causes, uh, your, your, your health to go haywire. And so after several months of just completely getting rid of that, you know, those tight junctions will heal, your gut will heal and your, your glycocalyx will heal. All these things will, will, all your defense mechanisms will, will tighten up again. And then so you actually can reintroduce some of these things more safely because they're not slipping into your systemic circulation. Your body can actually have barrier protection and keep a lot of this stuff out. So that makes, that makes perfect sense. And, uh, and we see a lot of people, especially with, uh, autoimmune issues, they have to be much more careful as well. And so, but again, after sort of three months, six months on a carnivore diet, they can, and, and a lot of them will, they'll really need to be like on like grass fed red meat. You know, they really can't even deal with pork and chicken and eggs, uh, certainly not dairy. And then after six months or so, they can actually tolerate some of those things again. And, and so it has a lot to do with that when your body sort of heals and it actually has these, uh, has much more robust defenses. Whereas if, if we're just eating all this stuff for decades, eventually you just wear down the system, you know, you just, you break down the walls, you know? And, and, uh, so, uh, that makes, that makes perfect sense. You sort of discovered all of that just on your own, just through, through trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. I guess because of like the more remote area that I'm from, um, a lot of the stuff that's well known now, I didn't have access to that at the time. Like I, I feel I wasn't even well known. It's like being more recently that it's like yeah. more mainstream this information, but it was like, yeah, like going carnivore, um, and even like listening to like Rob Wolf and stuff, even I, I know he had like a paleo autoimmune protocol, which I tried for a while. And I was like, yeah, like it worked great. And even now he'll say, he's like, probably carnival is the best approach for someone with an autoimmune condition. And mm -hmm. even though um, I'm pretty sure I've had like autoimmune stuff in my blood tests, it's still not definitive. Um, I just sort of label myself as having an autoimmune condition because I'm, I, I definitely have noticed that I've got like a very severe and I've had genetic testing done since and um, genetic testing. I've had blood tests done and I'm definitely, I have the celiac gene and I have severe reactions to gluten. So, you know, I have that. Um, I more recently, I did have some issues in my thyroid again recently when I started playing around some dairy again, like I hadn't healed, like I thought I'd maybe I'd healed more than I had, but obviously hadn't. And maybe just dairy is not for me, but yeah, gluten and dairy are two things that I just have to completely just avoid. Yeah, but yeah. I do when I when I do go carnivore, I I am more robust. Like my body will just I don't even have to work out, and I'll sit at like I think I'm at like seventy seven or seventy something kilos now. But when I went carnivore and I uh, was way more strict, my body was like eighty three kilos, and I was like yeah. not even doing anything, and it's just like my body just <laughs> wanted to hold muscle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which which makes sense. I mean, I, I think that, you know, I mean, I argue that just from a biological perspective, humans are carnivores. And so this is just the, our natural way of eating. And we're just going to be healthier when we do that. Um, I think that too, I don't think you have to worry about, um, you know, if you're in a survival mode, if you know what plants are, are safer to eat, like you should be fine. Like, in fact, the, the longer you're away from these things, the better you'll be because, you know, your, your body's going to be, you know, uh, very, very healthy and have its defenses up against a lot of these toxins, you know, and, and if you really do need to transition over to eating carbohydrates or eating, um, these other, other, uh, plants that have these sort of defense chemicals in them, you know, your, your body will adjust and will adapt. And, and maybe there will be like a, you know, a few days that you're, you're sort of an adjustment period, but your body will, will be able to adapt pretty, pretty much right away. Like you don't, you don't have to keep your body primed for that. In fact, like your liver, you know, is making tons and tons and tons of, of enzymes and they're used for different things, but they get used up in different processes. And so if you're eating 
different plants with different toxins, then your liver is detoxifying these things. And, it, and it's sort of running out of these, these enzymes, maybe build more and, and build up a tolerance to it. But, um, you know, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I just, as a, as a personal sort of piece of advice, I, I don't think you need to worry about losing your ability to eat plants. Um, you know, just by, by saying off them, I actually think you'd be probably in, in, in stronger position, the longer you stay away from them, you know, and then getting that survival, uh, period. And hopefully you don't, you don't end up in one of those, you know? And, well, uh, actually I do. I, I want to go. Back. Hopefully you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Al alone I'm, season nine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that's, that's where I'm at now. I have found it's just like it, you know, I've, I've tried to add more and more plants in at my own deprimant doesn't, you know, I've tried gaps, um, which that, that helped in its own way. A lot of the broths and slow cook meats like that, that, I won't knock that, but I do feel it's just like it's undeniable when I eat mostly meat. And this is just where I'm at. And just I've, I've been playing around with all this stuff for years and years. When I eat mostly meat, only a small amount of plants, but ones I can tolerate, I feel better. Yeah. And it's just well, like you're, you're preaching to the choir, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but, um, it's interesting what you say. When I was on that challenge and naked and afraid, there was, um, I did like I started eating some water reeds, but I did notice like because they were so starchy, I I actually started to get some of my stomach issues back from those. Like I started to get a little little bit of diarrhea, um, which I wasn't really getting from like the bugs and the crabs and 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 that stuff that I was eating. Um, and also, there was these acacia beans, and they tasted like sugar and lemon, and um, that like with that stuff. Uh, and this is where it was complicated. Like it, for me personally, probably even in a survival situation, it would have been hard for me to like solely live off plants because um, maybe it's just from myself personally. Like I felt like I was tolerating what, when I'm in the wild, like especially when I'm up in indigenous land and stuff, eating the wild berries and stuff up there, I seem to tolerate them great. Like a lot of the wild foods don't seem to be as harsh on my body, but like a lot of wild foods, uh, plants in Australia are extremely toxic. So you got to be careful as well. But back to naked and afraid, there was these acacia beans and um, I definitely had a limit to what I could eat. Like I couldn't push it any further and I'd, I'd, I'd eaten them for a fair while and I just could not, my body could not tolerate any more than roughly a handful. handful. What was happening was like my lips were literally splitting apart mm. and it was just like that was super, um, I guess we'll say acidic, which should have been helping me in a way like having, like I'm guessing like maybe having a more acidic stomach or something should have helped me. But yeah, there was like a limit that I could eat eat those and like it was just my body knew and it wouldn't it just i would just have like zero appetite for any more than roughly a handful and if i did try to force any more i'd get this rash around my mouth mouth and my lips would start to split it was just like and it was the same with like the um the watery uh tubers on the bottom it was like i could only eat so many and it was like my body was just like we're done so it was interesting and it was just like through through that experience i was like there was a bit of an eye opener. It was like, I didn't, yeah, it was just like, like proof in the pudding, like protein and, and meat really being a strong, easy food source for me that didn't give me many reactions, but even trying to like go heavy on the plants and stuff didn't, didn't go that way at the end of the day. Yeah. And that's the thing too, is that if you're eating the sort of the same plants all the time, have the same toxins and your body will not be able to defend it as well anymore. You have to go through alternate, uh, ways of, of breaking it down, but also they're going to, they're not going to be able to break it down as much. You'll get, you get more of a toxic effect and you'll run out of these enzymes. This is why, why you don't take, um, uh, grapefruit. We don't eat grapefruit when you're taking different medications because, mm -hmm they have different toxins in them, like furanocumarins that are toxic and your body has to detoxify these things in your liver. And then you run out of those enzymes, but those enzymes are also what's processing and metabolizing the medications you're on. So it gets all haywire. It's either not working enough or, or it's a much higher dose and you end up with toxicities, uh, or not, or it's not working. So, um, you know, if you're ever going to eat plants, you want to eat like a little bits of a variety and change it up. You never want to eat like the same sort of thing, like 
you know, every meal. And that, and that's probably part of the problem too, is when people do go plant place or just even, even eating a standard diet, they're sort of eating consistent things. You know, they're eating like spinach salads every day, every day it's spinach salads and carrots or whatever. And they get this buildup and their body is just not able to over overcome it because yes, their uh, defenses get overwhelmed, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely can uh, agree with yeah, that. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you saw it firsthand, you know, yeah. and, and just like a little bit more, um, more in your face with the, those more serious sort of reactions as well. Yeah, mm. and you've been uh, clearly like living out in the wild and and hunting and fishing and and foraging since you were a kid. Or you, I mean, so you have you have a pretty good idea of what plants you can get away with eating, and even and even then you were you were finding you had to you had to limit it. It sounds like. I mean, realistically, even depending on the location, plants are pretty hard to pretty hard to come by depending on the season as well. So it's like it's mm. your food source, uh, like the protein meat sort of foods are definitely more of the go to as far as like you know really getting the bang bang for your buck as far as like real long lasting like energy is anyway. I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then and then would your Aboriginal friends would they? Are, are they eating many plants if they if they don't have to or is it just sticking to meat if they have meat um to be honest like the, like indigenous communities aren't really eating that great like there's a lot of health issues yeah. in indigenous communities and that's one of my biggest passions is like um like i'm not trying to force anyone to do anything i love just when i go up there and i eat the way i do and do the things i do and i'm passionate about the fishing and hunting that you know hopefully they're like oh okay like you know maybe eating less bread and sugar and flour and that stuff and drinking less soft drink like hopefully you know because it, yeah it in short really like indigenous communities are in a bit of a bad place at the moment as far as health health goes it's like they have access to so much good food but i guess they're just bombarded through the shops and stuff they like the quality of food as far as the shop goes that they have access to, um, isn't great. Yeah. Like they definitely that they're bombarded with, with some pretty crappy foods is like the nicest way I can say it. Mm, and, yeah. um, it just sucks, you know, like just to see some of the health issues that happen. It's yeah, it, it is pretty heart heartbreaking actually. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I've seen with my mates, like they've definitely changed the way they eat mm -hmm. a, a little bit after seeing how I eat. Like I've, I've definitely seen a reduction in like, how much bread they eat and swapping it out for some other stuff, which is great. Nice. But ultimately it's like, yeah, I don't want to be in that position where I'm trying to force anyone to do anything. It's like, I just do, do my thing. And mm -hmm. they, you know, if they take anything away from that, that's, that's great. But more just like that, getting them more passionate about like the, the wild stuff, which is probably a bit better than the shop stuff. Mm -hmm. So you, when you're up there, you'll kind of be the one that's sort of leading the charge, like, Hey, let's go out hunting. Oh no, it's definitely not. No, nah, all right. Nah, indigenous people absolutely love oh, okay. hunting. It's usually like I'm the one who's who's trying to have a bit of a rest because I'm <laughs> I'm like worn out from all the hunting, and then they'll they'll turn up and they're like, "We're going out again." I'm like, "Oh crap, okay." <laughs> um, but they, so, and then they, they also eat the kill as well. Yeah, we totally share it. So generally, um, to be honest, yeah, I, I, it, it's got to that stage now. It's like I'm mostly just hunting with the indigenous people. Like it's only yeah, like I go hunting by myself Hunt, like yeah not as much as i used to just because i just i do enjoy going out with them a lot more mm. so yeah like yeah. it's just like, like i love that camaraderie and like that, oh yeah that, you know going out and that that whole hunting aspect of like everyone doing it for a purpose doing it for food and um and that like that they're also doing it as well like they're they're splitting it up between a lot of families like um yeah like they're really stretching the food out that's why we end up hunting so much is because like we're feeding so many people community. yeah yeah and then uh there's been stages where like say someone's car's broken down or um something like that i've had it had the call like one of my indigenous mates being like hey can you go out and get like a cow or a pig like we're where the fridge is empty and i'm like all right <laughs> then, then i'll go out with the bow and i'll get it done and process up a cow by myself and bring it back oh good on you <laughs> now nice. um and I'm sure everyone says this to you, but Anthony and I are actually legit. We want to come out hunting with you and we want to experience yeah. life with you in the bush. Yeah. Like, uh, what what, what sort of opportunities funny. do you have for people? Us. At, at, at this stage, like, I've, I've never, <clears throat> I've never advertised anything. It's just been through word of mouth and initially just started uh, a couple of my mates 
and uh, people seeing what I was doing and they're like, oh, hey, can I come out and experience this with you? And um, I was a little bit hesitant in the beginning, but yeah, I've started to, um, you know, like it won't be a lot of people, but it, yeah, like every now and again, I'll let, it, let a couple of people up there with me and, and uh, yeah, get to experience the, the uh, way I've been living. Like we don't bring any food. It's literally whatever we, we catch over the 10 days. If we don't catch anything, then we're going to be pretty hungry. Um, and yeah, like just really immerse ourselves into that, that, that kind of way of life. And yeah, absolutely. I love it. And I'm so pumped any, any time someone wants to come up with me and, and experience it. And I'd love to take you, take you guys up there. But it'll uh, probably be one of the hardest things you ever do. <laughs> yeah. That's sure man. Man. No, I've, I've always wanted to do something like that. Like seriously, that was one of the, that was one of the big like drive for me, like coming to Australia, it was just like, I had this like fantasy of like me, someone like yourself or like native Australians and just be like, and I just go out of the bush and just like, just live out in nature for a while and just, and just, you know, be a man in the wild and like, just kill things with your hands and, you know, just see what that's like, because I, I'm just getting more and more, uh, interested in that and just more and more, uh, I don't know, just worn out with, with just awful modern technology and stupid phones just on this stupid thing all stupid day and i hate it you know i just want to like an excuse to just get the hell away from it and just this experience life how it's like supposed to be lived you know my only warning would be uh you might not want to go back to normal yeah, life. that's it yeah well you know but like at least that would tell me that and I'd be like okay well i just need to just get a ranch somewhere and just you know just just peace out you know and, and that's the thing in, in america a lot of people just do just just go and walk about as well and they just there's all these these uh state parks if it's if it's state land anyone is welcome to go there you can camp and fish and you know you need permits for certain things but um you can just go out onto state land and and most of the western states like 90 95 of the land is state land which is i don't know it's kind of bullshit but it's uh but that's that's how it is and so there are people that just go off grid and just go out and just live in the woods and just and just live there and they just that's just what they do you know which is just crazy and um so you don't even need to buy a ranch you can just just go off into the woods and just hang out you know and um you can't really build a house or a cabin or anything like that unless you like hide it i guess but like you know but it's uh but you can really do it and um no it would be it would be amazing i think that's that's uh sort of the dream just being out having having land and just being like a old school homesteader and just like living off the land and just, just being completely self-sufficient and just, you know, just being your own, your own man, you know, I think that's amazing. And I mean, and, and on that, I need some toughening up. I got, you know, I got soft, I got soft computer hands, you know, it's time for, you know, Anthony and I should have done this a long time ago, but it's time when we become real men. And uh, I think you leading us out in the bush would, uh, would really solidify that. Yeah. But uh, when you guys are ready, I'd be honored to take you through that little rite of passage. That'd be badass. I would love to. And so just to, just a, um, a quick question as well. Like, you know, Simon mentioned, like you're going on adventures with, uh, you know, the native boys. Like, is that, is that mostly hunting trips or do you do, do anything else out in the, out in the wild like that? Um, I guess we've, we've gone out like sometimes, especially in the wet season, we'll go out just to go, go swimming. And that generally in the wet season time, that's when the, the, berries and stuff are out so we'll go out and like collect some berries and go do some swimming stuff with all the kids and um we've gone out sometimes just to explore caves but generally it's just hunting and fishing it depends yeah. what they feel like eating or what the season is it's like when the barramundi are on then we're eating fish uh you know when the wallabies are in season we're getting wallabies it just totally depends what the season is and what the animal is going to be. But generally, yeah, it, we're mostly, we're mostly going out on hunting adventures. It's probably not exactly in your mind what you think it's going to be like. It's like we're on old busted four wheel drives going out. Sometimes they're catching cows with motorbikes or we're like chasing them and catching them by hand. But yeah. generally everything ends with catching, catching something by hand. Yeah. Cool. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, ju jumping off a Jeep, and onto a cow and like wrestling to the ground. That definitely sounds like an adventure. Yeah. That's, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's, it's not exactly technically the way that I do it. I, I, I'm more mm. of like, I try to be a bit more of a purist, like maybe wait on a water hole for an animal to come in and then just literally have to Jump change it. it from scratch. 
is is if use came out is is more in clock like it's more likely what we'll be doing. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I can guarantee it's probably going to be the craziest thing you ever do. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see too. And then you, you set up things where like maybe you'll have like you know work like Velo- Velociraptors where one like chases out here and like <laughs> scare it into like the pack of the the rest of the pack and they just jump them. Well, this is a thing. Like I, I've generally um, oh well, like I've had people come out on tour with me before, and um, even with two people, you can kind of like steer an animal back to the other person when you're chasing it with just two people. So um, no raptors, just people. But um, yeah, like, so I can like, I can't even imagine what it'd be like if you had more people on the ground chasing something. Like I've seen with the indigenous guys, you know, there'd be like five guys um, distracting an animal while someone runs up behind it and grabs it. But it, yeah, it's like, you can see why when you've got more people, it definitely makes the situation a lot easier. So yeah. That'd be interesting. Well, I'm interested to to tackle some kangaroos. See how that goes. <laughs> Good luck. I don't, yeah. Maybe maybe a cow would be easier. I think. Yeah, uh, well, a cow's definitely not easier, but um, technically, we'll probably just be catching pigs and and bulls. So it's yeah. not going to be easier than a kangaroo, but it's going to be. Um, right, okay. That's probably the road we're going to go down. As long as long as they got balls, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll get some good footage of you eating some balls out in the bush oh no yeah uh, well they're getting cooked there's, there's actually a thing in uh, montana where they where they you know when they process all the steers and they castrate all the all the young uh um bull you know calves bulls now steers and they they just have just you know tens of thousands of these you know testicles and so they call it the testicle festival and they just have all these like food stands and you just like cook these things up fry them up so you just like all the food stands are just all like you know testicle and testicle related uh food yeah, stuff wow. you know, like and, then, uh, and, and then later that night it's um you know it just turns into a, a raucous kind of yeah, just like some, yeah, yeah. Have, you, have you guys uh tested like the testicle so far yet like the testicles or I've, I've, yeah, never I've never tried it myself. No. Yeah, yeah, it's actually surprising. It's probably, if I'm honest, it's probably as far as like taste goes, it's one of the easiest parts of the animal to eat. It's like right. it actually just it tastes so good. It's actually weird. It it's you might think it's like you're like, oh wow, this is gonna be crazy. It's it's probably one of the easiest parts of the animal to eat as far as yeah. flavor goes. Like it's just so easy. It's fine. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to like. No, I definitely it. try it. I, I I just don't know. I don't know if I'd like the thought in my head. It was like, hmm, I like the taste of that. You know, I don't think I want to know that about myself. You know? <laughs> if you if you if you find that easy, then we'll do the pizzle. Oh, what's that? Uh, oh, for mm. the penis. No. Yeah. No. Uh, pass same as necessary uh, again, so. let me i guess you know, any, anyone who's eaten like a sausage or a salami or something like that you you've eaten that you know that's just that's just where they they just grind up anything and put that in sausages well, that's actually the texture of testicles they taste just like as if you're eating a sausage or something it's got like, like literally the same texture and taste. yeah yeah that like, makes if, sense. to compare it to anything it's just like that's kind of how easy it is i feel to eat yeah. that's my that's my view on it like everyone might not see it the same way when they actually come to the point of eating it it could be a little bit different yeah well i've seen i seen a video of one guy doing it and he was he was definitely going for shock value and he's like cutting his over he's like oh yeah that's great he's smushing down slurping it and i was like oh no no and uh, and he's doing it on purpose you know he's really trying to trying to freak people out but it looked it looked you know it looked like it was uh you know consistency wise it was and texture wise probably yeah it would be quite easy to eat uh just on its own yeah without doing too much special yeah uh, well, we'll hopefully uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find, find out, out. I guess, yeah, yeah. We, we're really gonna find out <laughs> all right um i think we'll wrap there adam thank you so much for joining us I mean, you've got so many great stories and you know it was really fun chatting with you thank you uh thank you gentlemen for for having me on i really appreciate it thank you that was awesome yeah we'll have to do it again and definitely uh definitely plan on coming up that's a uh, that's uh that would be awesome if we can do that <laughs>